Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so for your, uh, our first speaker post-lunch, we are going to have Kirill Solovyov. He, Kirill is a lead researcher, a security researcher at Possible Security in Latvia, and he describes himself as the most visible white hat hacker in Latvia. And he's going to talk about quite a catastrophic event, the leak of billions of passwords. Put your hands together for Kir Kirill Solovyovs. This is a story about a businessman. Ivan had recently started his business. He decided that he's going to be a reseller of sorts. He was working with big data, reselling data, like many new startups do. He was working alone, and it was the winter of 2018. He's just got a bunch of new customers, each of them paying him a nice amount of money. And he was walking home when he learned that a competitor has emerged as a market, a competitor that is stealing his business, copying his data, and he's going to lose his profit. So that story is, of course, imaginary, but that's how I imagine what happened with the password leaks this January. And we'll get back to that. We'll get back to the process for those of you who haven't, uh, haven't been following. But first, I want to talk about users. This is a user. And uh, users tend to use different websites, right? Um, for example, a user could create an account on a professional forum. Let's say a user is a welder, and he, he loves welding metal. So he has a metal welding forum. He chooses a secure password, creates an account on that forum. Now, not many users are too smart, unfortunately. Many of them are, but some of them are lazy, and they tend to use the same password for a different site. For example, their Gmail account as well. And then let's talk about hackers. Hackers can come and try to get the passwords out. And there are multiple ways for hackers to do it. Now, actually, many people would think that how hackers get the passwords in most cases, is by hacking your computer, hacking your devices, but that is absolutely not true. That's not how hackers get the majority of passwords. Then there's another way, which is also not the number one way, and those are online attacks, meaning that a hacker would try to connect to your forum, to your email, enter your email address, and try a bunch of different passwords. Now, the speed of an online attack, first of all, is usually super slow. An attacker with a good internet connection for a good service can get a speed of maybe up to 50 different passwords per second, maybe 100 if he's lucky passwords per second. And second point being, online attacks are usually detected automatically and blocked. As soon as a user enters an incorrect password, let's say five times, the account is blocked. And that prevents attacker from ever finding the real password, right? Similar to a bank card where we have the PIN number. Um, that's where database breaches come in, this different kind of attack, where instead of trying to guess the password as the user would log in, attacker uses vulnerability in the software to download the whole database, including any content if it's not encrypted, and also, of course, usernames and passwords. Now, usernames and passwords are sometimes encrypted, especially the passwords, and sometimes they are not. And if they're encrypted, what the attacker can do is do offline attack. Offline attack means the attacker has an encrypted form of password, and they can brute force it on their own server, or they can rent resources in the cloud. And resources in the cloud are really, really powerful. For example, if 
they are encrypted using a function called MD5, which you shouldn't do, but, but that's the status quo for many of these old sites. Uh, then attacker can run through all possible eight symbol passwords in less than 30 minutes on one of the most powerful single Amazon servers that you can get right now. I'm not talking about attacker combining multiple servers like that. If your password is nine characters, small letters, capital letters, symbols, numbers, then it takes 80 days on the same server for the attacker. Of course, attackers can also do wordless attacks instead of brute force attacks. So we have to really think about the passwords we have. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. So let's get back to this scenario here. Usually, an attacker would use a vulnerability in a website and get the password. And since the user has used the same password in multiple websites, their online life is basically compromised. Now, there are many hackers, and many of them are bad guys. I'm, a, I'm, I'm the good kind of hacker, but many of them are bad guys, and they do this kind of things. There's many different sites. Another hacker would get passwords from that. Now, what happens then? What happens after an attacker steals the database with the passwords? Well, it used to be that they would use those passwords. They would do whatever they need to do, uh, try, to, try to access your bank account, try to access your email, get some info on you, sell it, threaten you, blackmail you. That's not the case anymore. These days, the criminal world on the internet is really well structured. It's, it's running like a separate black economy there. We see people stealing passwords, they just steal passwords, and then they sell the passwords to someone else. This is Ivan in our story from before. He's buying different password lists for a reasonable amount of money from different hackers, and then he is offering those for sale on the black market. And you can buy them all together by paying a single payment or, or monthly payment, depending, depending on the model. And different other attackers, different other cyber criminals, then go ahead and buy that password, uh, the password list, uh, to use however they see, if they see fit. If it's a fraudster, they will try to steal your identity. If, if, it's, uh, people, if those are the people who want blackmail you, they will send you one of those emails. You've seen those, right? We've hacked your username and password, and we've filmed you. How are you doing bad stuff at your computer? Now pay us. So th those, are, those are these guys, some of these. But what can sometimes happen, especially in the criminal world, and, and also sometimes it happens in, in legitimate software world, is that people can start reselling data. And that's what happened. One of the, actually multiple of these buyers started reselling it for a cheaper price. And then, Eventually, it leaked to the gray web, or let's say the, the classical web semi-closed forums where researchers like me can more easily access the data. So that's what we did. We took a look at the data. Here's, here's what happened in, in that. This is a semi-public semi forum. It's not on the dark web. It's, it's available through, through this standard DNS. Um, here's the profile of Corpse. He, he touts himself ethical hacker and coder. And um, his account is short-lived. So basically, he registered in 6th of January, and it was closed, banned on 30th of January. Let's see why. Um, so this is what it was all about. There was this flyer going on. You may have seen part of it in the press. This is a full high-resolution version. And uh, basically, you can pay $45 to this guy called Sonix, which is not the guy from the previous slide, um, and get lifetime access to all these different lists and updates, including such databases as anti-public, which basically uh, means that's a database that is not available to the, to the wider public. Well, now it is, but back then it wasn't. And um, Clorox also started doing, doing the same. Um, so what happened is uh, Corpse came back to the forum and, and said, so, you know, I'm the creator of these collections. And I'm leaking my own collections because other people were reselling them. That is, that is how that happened, right? And we have other people coming back and repackaging those collections for easier access, like in one torrent, where you can download all the collections in one torrent. And that's great. All we needed was an internet connection and a couple of large hard drives to start working on analyzing the passwords and understanding what's inside there. And what's inside there is files. Um, many of them are text files, but 
about 20% are not. And we have different, different kind of files, garbage, good files, um, empty files as well. So what we did, of course, we look at it and we try to understand, first of all, what it is, what's in there that is not passwords, right? It's a large collection. Maybe there's something interesting in there. Well, we found some interesting files. For example, this file here, there's a Word document that actually says, we will rent you a domain name. We will rent you a web page. And on your right, you see the number of ranking on different search engines for those search keywords. Um, so I don't know if it was there intentionally, if one of the hackers involved in the process were trying to make some additional business, or, or it, it came in there later, but that's one of the files we have there. We also have Word documents, which are verbatim copies of web pages that still include the links, direct links to the hack database where it was copied from. Um, so we have a bunch of interesting stuff. We have pictures. Um, the message here uh, basically says, will you fight me? Um, so we do have quite amazing stuff. We also have some programs in there. This is a Python script that processes one of the files in there. And I'll say right now, I would love for if there would be a Python script for every file on there, because it's a dump literally and, and in a figurative sense. Um, there are a bunch of different formats, and it's not at all what's been advertised. In the flyer, if you paid attention, uh, you can actually see that there's a standardized format for these dumps that you can buy for 50, $45 lifetime access. Username, colon, password. Well, about 80% of the files are like that. The rest are not. And it's really hard to process them. So having something that processes them would be um, nice, of course. Now, how much actual useful stuff is there? Well, the first rule of data usefulness here, it has to be unique, right? So if we take a look at everything before extracting anything, one fourth are duplicates. One fourth can be safely deleted, and, and they already exist there. So that's what we did. Um, then we, of course, extract them. And then the situation is much, much better. So 99% are text files, and that is what we focus on later on. But size-wise, it's quite a large dump. So we have so-called collection one, which is 40 gigabytes. We have a collections two through five and anti-public, which is around 350 gigs. Uh, we also have 12 billion special. And this is, this is one, of, one of the cleanest files in that sense. Like, if you, if you want to repeat some of our research and you don't have the capacity to work with such amount of data, that's the file you should be going for. There's just, it's just, just one file, 90 gigabytes of size, nice format, clean, really useful. Um, then we have the big database, aptly named, 600 gigs. So that totals to one terabyte of data before extraction. Uh, when we extract it, we get one terabyte more. So we get about a bit more than two terabytes of data, so, so three, three to four terabyte disk can be used to work with that. Luckily, when we remove all the duplicates afterwards, we are left with just below 900 gigabytes of unarchived data. So the actual amount is not what they are trying to sell. But I mean, it is a criminal world, so uh, what did you expect? Um, here, is, here is the deduplication program trying to remove the duplicate files. This is after extraction. Most, like a bit more than half, are duplicate files. So not that much unique. Uh, before I actually jump into the interesting part of what we found, and I do have some new things that have not been presented before in, in our presentation like that, I want to talk about the tools. So you people love open access, open tools, right? So. If you, if you get curious about that, you can, you can take a look. So I want to give you some tool set. Um, obviously, many, if not all of you, have heard of, uh, heard of GNU Core Utils. All the, all the standard GNU utilities, those are great. Um, in addition, of course, we used uh, such tools as Find, Cut, Grab. Anyone here has used Grab? How many, how many Grab users? OK, 80%. Not bad. Um, and the set, of course, is a bit harder. Who has used set meaningfully? OK, about, about 60%. Um, and the tool, I mean, these, these tools are great, and most of you know them. Um, the tool I really appreciate and that I have been using for other research after we finish that is Progress. Who has used Progress? GNU Progress. One, two, three, four, including me. Progress is a superb tool when you're working with large amounts of data. 
As you know, in, in GNU world, everything is supposed to be a text file. So we work with a lot of text files. These are text files as well. And progress works really nicely with those. Doesn't even have to be a text file. This is an output of, of, of progress. So basically, when processing that terabyte of information, progress can allow you to see the progress of syscalls. So read, write, you can see it real time. And you can plan ahead. You can understand, will we be able to make it for this presentation? For example, filtering out data for Bulgaria when preparing this presentation on, on our machine with external hard drive took around uh, six hours, I think. So you can, you can plan ahead and you can understand. That's just filtering out before, before any additional post-processing. Now, from now on, we're going to talk about the unique files, but not unique records, because it's impossible as a researcher to distinguish if the user is dumb enough to use the same email address plus password for different sites, or it's just the same leak in different variation. So we kind of kind of have those together. And uh, the number is here. That's the actual amount of non-unique entries in the unique files is 26.7 billion entries. 26.7 billion is uh, quite a lot, I'd say. 26.7 billion is three and a half planets of people. So these are the biggest leaks of passwords recently. Now, the main question, but it's, it's a boring question, but still the first question is which password is the top password? Of course, it's this one. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, that we found in 15, 0.15% of all these 26 million entries. For this, we also tried to remove the duplicate entries, like if the username and password match exactly as a, as a combination. And then the number, um, then the number goes to uh, 0.62%. That means that basically when the user is using a bad password, they are probably also reusing it, which kind of makes sense. Now, the other passwords don't, doesn't, don't surprise me, right? We have still some, some digits. We have QWERTY, of course. We have password and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. These are the top passwords, passwords in the world according to the leak of January 2019. Um, what one of the additional things that we did for this presentation, this is the first time uh, we're showing that, is we tried to analyze the passwords. Now, and for that, we took all the passwords, all the 26 billion passwords, we removed the email addresses, and we looked just at the passwords, and only the unique passwords. So if, you, if your password is 123456, it appears one time here, just once. And we wanted to understand how people create passwords. And understandably, lowercase letters is the clear majority. And capital letters are the minority. People don't like to use the shift, or you know, many people actually use caps lock for in, in, instead of shift, it's true. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to use that, so they try not to use it. We have some digits because, of course, when the annoying website tells you, no, your password, password is insecure, what you do, you go back and you type password one, right, because you need to have a digit. That's why we have many digits and, of course, some symbols as well. Now, this is filtered for ASCII. We are not talking about fancy Unicode passwords here, just, just ASCII passwords. Let's take a closer look. Uh, these are the digits. As I said, password one, right? We, we, see, it. we see it right there. Um, of course, zero to three, those are popular ones, and, and nine, but uh, four to eight, not really. Um, looking at most popular characters, these are just some of them. There are uh, many, many other characters that are being used. Dash is the most popular, then we have dot. Morse code, maybe, but probably not. Um, the semicolon, add sign, pipe sign, space. I'm really happy to see space up there because having space in the password means that people are using passphrases. Or it just means that we have terrible quality of data, which can be the case with these 26 billion records coming from that. Now, the breaking news we discovered when looking at the data for this presentation today comes from this slide. This slide simply shows the frequency of letters being used in the passwords. And it doesn't match quite up with the English frequency of letters. That means the passwords are not predominantly from English-speaking users. But obviously, 
capital letters, as we already know, they are used less. That's why we see the red is much lower. But if we pay attention to the red part, we can see that for most letters, it correlates. If you have a lot of lowercase letter A, we have a lot of lower, uh, uppercase letter A. If we have uh, not, not too much lowercase letter, uh, letter J, we have not too much uppercase letter J. So these correlate in between them, except when we look at capital I and lowercase l. If you look at capital I, depicted in red here, we can see that even though lowercase i is used twice as much as h, we don't see that increase in uppercase. For lower, lowercase l, it's the same. Even though uppercase l is used twice as much as, say, k, um, we, don't, we don't see that, that increase over there, right? We see m, if we compare it here, m is used much more than l, talked about lowercase. What does it mean? And a capital, a capital O also is the same. It means that people write down their passwords, because otherwise there is no reason why you need to be able to distinguish between lowercase l or capital I. If you write it down, you need to be able to read it back. That's why you don't include those letters in your passwords. That's the only reason we could find. And, and it's quite interesting that we managed to actually find some proof that majority of people do write their passwords down. Now, where do the users come from? And there are multiple ways to look at that, to try to answer that question. One of the easiest ways is to look at the email addresses. It is not a perfect way, but IP addresses are contained in less than 10% of the entries, in less than even 5% of the entries in the leaks. So looking at IP addresses is not representative. That's why I looked at the emails. Of course, number one is .com, with more than 30, 13 billion, that's about half of the passwords coming from .com accounts. Uh, second place, .ru, Russia. And that means that these are basically Russian hackers hacking Russian users. These are the leaks we're seeing there. Um, third place, Germany, a bit more than 1 billion passwords. And then we have other, for example, .NET, we have France, we have UK, um, we, have, we also have stuff like Italy, Poland, Czech Republic, Japan, uh, Brazil, of course, and the others, right? Canada, US. US is only here because majority of the US users historically use .com, obviously. Um, Spain, China, Austria, Taiwan, and educational uh, domain. And, uh, of course, we also have the rest of the world here. Uh, that all of that is in, in the leaks. I'm not actually sure about, uh, about the frozen continent, but uh, that's what I imagine. Here's uh, Europe zoomed in a bit more, in case you're interested. Now, one thing is how dumb are the users, but another thing is how smart is the government. So we took a look at the government domains. And the US government is the majority. So what we did for this, we just filtered all the, uh, all the unique email addresses, all the, all the domains in there, and uh, looked at how many times a domain appears, and then showed it by the TLD. So .gov, that's for US, is almost 50%, then UK, then Austria. Mm, quite, quite in line with that. To talk about what's, what ha what's happening here in Bulgaria, I'm going to bring up the comparison of the Baltic states. Uh, I'm from Latvia, by the way. And uh, Latvia was kind of the leader of, of whatever, whatever graph you want to put there. Latvia had the most leaks, but then, then, then we added Bulgaria, and hey, we're not, we don't have the most passwords. Uh, to, to be fair, this probably, this graph has to be taken, uh, you have to take into consideration the amount of people in the country, you know, to, to understand this graph. Um, nicely. Here is, uh, for, for comparison, I also, I also took Macedonia that has literally uh, almost no leaks in, in, in the leak dump. So that's how we see there. Um, next thing we did, we took a look at the actual domains. And why is that important? Here are domains for Estonia, for example. The most popular domain, the most email addresses appear, hot.ee, then we have online.ee, then we have mail.ee. Um, these are the ones for Lithuania, starts as 1.lt, and Latvia. And why is it important? It allows us to understand as researchers how old or fresh the data is. 1.lv hasn't been accepting registrations for 10 or 15 years. It hasn't been even working for the past five to eight years. And we still see 
quite a lot of those in the leaks. That means these are leaks over a broad period of time, collected over time. Here's .mk. As, as you see, um, mk, because of the number of the leaks, it's so low, we see that there are many different domains of .mk. Now, for Bulgaria, this is what we have. We have ABV. Is that some email service, right? Yeah, yeah. And then we have mail.bg, and then we have dir.bg. And then we, the other ones are, are negligible, basically. So many, so I suppose these services, the first two services are really popular and most people that use services, local services, that end in .bg use those. Um, looking at the government data, uh, not databases, looking at the government email address, we didn't look at any government databases, I promise. Uh, so looking at the email addresses for the government, for Estonia we see um, that number one is Ministry of Systems. I think that's their IT ministry. Um, for Lithuania, Ministry of Statistics. And uh, for Latvia, we have a whole variety. Many of them don't fit on the graph here. Uh, but number one is the Foreign Ministry, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, now, Ministry of Foreign Affairs also for Macedonia. Now, for, for Bulgaria, I tried filtering by .gov.bg, but nothing useful came up. Apparently, you don't use that, right? You use a bit, a bit, different, a bit different setup. So we filtered for that. Why not? This is what I have. But the names, I mean, they don't make any sense to me. I didn't want to open all those web pages. So I guess it's Ministry of something, so right? M, what's, what's ME? What? No one knows. OK. Maybe some secret ministry that uses, uses for spam. So yeah, that's number one. ME, government.bg, then no idea what all the other mean, but uh, MFA is there as well in place number eight. So quite a lot of leaks from there as well. Now, let's take a look at the usernames. And usernames serve multiple purposes. Uh, for one, they're useful to understand if the data is real, what's the data quality. And they're also useful to try and see if the data is actually related to the country. For example, if we see some local names in the usernames of that email, of, of email address of that country, we would, could assume, we could conclude uh, that the data is legit. So here are a couple select countries. We have Latvia and some Balkan countries here. And uh, number one, top user for each of these is either info or office, which makes sense. Sometimes, you know, you, you just register your, your, your main email address, right? You open a service, and you want everyone in your company or in your agency to, to get those emails from that service. Now, let's look a bit further down. And uh, here, we already see that for Latvia, for example, we see Janis. Janis is the most popular male pronoun uh, war, uh, mail name in Latvia. We already see proof that Latvian email addresses are legit. Now, for the rest of these, we, we still see info and admin and, and maybe contact. Let's scroll down to the bottom. Um, this, is, this is what we see. So we see a bunch of names. All these names ending with S, those are mail names um, from, uh, from Latvia. Huh? For Bulgaria, uh, we don't see any names so people don't like to use them in the email address, or at least those that do, do not use .bg emails. That might also be the conclusion. But we see that, for example, in uh, Serbia, in, um, in, in emails that belong to Yugoslavia, we see those names in there. And finally here, um, last line, we see someone. So uh, Ivan or Ivan, is that one of the popular names here? Yeah, OK, so the data may be legit. Yeah, great. OK. Now, that's users, and that's useful. But looking at passwords is even more useful. For example, one of the things that my company does, we do penetration testing. That may include cracking passwords, social engineering, stuff like that. And we need to have word lists. And having a password list is, is great if you can tailor it to a country. So let's look at top passwords for a couple of countries. Once again, Latvia and some Balkan countries. Number one, <laughs> obviously, but, 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 uh, here, here's the difference. How many of those users used the password per country? <laughs> this, 
for, for these slides, these are unique users and passwords. So if someone reused, if, if I have an email admin at dump.com and I use password 123456 at multiple places, it's only going to show up as one entry in this statistic here. OK, uh, what other passwords do we see? Well, we see some standard passwords, right? Uh, QWERTY, 1234567979. 5, so basically nothing, nothing interesting. This, this becomes a bit suspicious, uh, a, bit, a bit hard. If we scroll down further, in red, I've added some local wor words that mean something in the local language. Once again, uh, we have, here we have uh, the capital. We have um, some names. Parola means password in Latvian. And luckily, we can type it without any special characters, so that's why people use it. It's, it's nice and short, six characters, easy to remember. So that's why people choose it, right? So these are the top passwords. Now, I excluded two of the Balkan countries that I had on my previous slide um, because, well, that's, that's the data um, for, for those countries. Um, well. So that, that's our official conclusion uh, of, of the data. Um, it looks like the data quality is bad enough that it just doesn't make any, any sense for those particular countries. Those are not passwords that someone would randomly type, that many users would randomly create. Those are not passwords that appear anywhere else on the internet. We, don't, we just don't know. We, we can conclude that data quality is a bit, is a bit shabby for those two countries. Now, another thing that always interested me as a whitehead hacker and may also be useful in my work are recovery questions. Because reading, reading all, the, all the different books that there are, none of them usually address the question of, you know, what is what people choose? Even for passwords, what you usually do as a researcher or a uh, person that's interested in the topic, you go to some GitHub or somewhere where there are password leaks and you look at the top passwords. For recovery questions, we don't have anything like that, let alone books. So it was very interesting for me and my team to look at recovery questions because the data quality for those two gigabytes of leaks, sorry, two terabytes of leaks are so bad that we actually have all different stuff there. You saw Word documents, there are Excel documents, images, and we also have some databases with recovery questions, full database dumps. That's great. So um, some of the recovery questions to help those of you who are also pen testers uh, to, to, to better achieve your objective. Uh, one question that people choose is that. And uh, let me interject here right now. There are two ways to do recovery questions if you do them at all. One way is you force a person to select one of five or ten recovery questions that your team thought up. What's your mother's maiden name? Which street you grew up on? Which school did you go to? What's the name of your dead cat that you had like 20 years ago? Um, and stuff like that. The other option is you don't do that and you ask the user to select their own recovery question. Now, I'm coming from where I thought the best way to do, if you need to have recovery questions, is to allow the user to select one. Because those default questions are so dumb and predictable, the answers to them are so predictable, that it's not secure. So I thought, OK, this is the best way to go. Now, looking at this data, I'm not, sure, not so sure anymore. Because so, a user selected recovery question, who are you? They literally typed it in. And the answer they obviously wrote in was, it's me. That was the right answer to get into the account. We have some other questions as well, like, for example, nil. That's a name in Russian, a person's name. What would the answer be to that if you got a question like that? Uh, of course, you obviously answer yes. And <laughs> dear in. Um, that's, how we, that's how users do it. And who am I? A very philosophical question of sorts, but not for this guy. This guy simply has his name in there, uh, which is probably part of his email address as well. Um, and. Finally, QWERTY, right? There are two possible answers to that, right? It could be either ASDFG or uh, QWERTY. So these are the, some of the recovery questions that people use. And now I want to talk about how to prevent that or how to minimize the damage of leaks like that. One thing that's a problem, of course, is password reuse. 
We talked about that at the very beginning. If users use the same password in multiple places, then what we get is we get attackers accessing their identities on different sites by cracking just one site. And those of you who are users and are not programmers or auditors or anything, just remember that. Go tell it to your family, to your partner, to your kids, to your old folks. Educate them, explain it to them. Send them the link to the presentation. Using strong passwords is just as important. Even if we don't reuse a password, when the database leaks, it's either encrypted or not. If it's not encrypted, then remember this. If it is encrypted, then what saves you is a strong password. If you have a password of, say, 16 characters, there's some spaces, some words, it's not something that's, that's available on the internet or in any, any literature, then you can be safe against attackers cracking a password. Because what attackers would do, they would crack all the database at the same time, and they would get 90, maybe 95% of the passwords easily, and they would not want to spend money to crack the tail of the password, the 5 or 1% of the hardest passwords. The metrics I talked about at the beginning, cracking an MD5 hash of 8 symbol, 8 character password in less than 30 minutes, it costs $15 to run that kind of server for, 15, uh, for 30 minutes. So attacker would not have much in incentive to try to successfully crack your 16-character password by spending, say, $2,000 on that and then understanding that your bank account only has 1000 right? So the more money you have, the stronger password you get to use. Password managers, obviously. Anyone here uses password managers? Wow, I'm pleasantly surprised. We have about 60, maybe 70% of people using password managers. That's great. Don't forget your master password and don't write it down. Um, there are recovery methods. I'm sure you're well versed of that, but use those. I'm, I'm an old school guy. I don't, I don't use that, but I got to start using that because my brain keeps my 30 character passwords. I have like 20 of them in here, and I don't have time to space in my brain to remember people's, people's names or faces. It's really it's terrible. I got, to, I got to switch to password manager myself, really. Finally, for the developers in the audience, I want to talk about salting. So some of you may have heard what salting is, but some of you may not. And for those of you who have not heard or don't understand the salting concept, um, I want to take time on this, one of the final slides, to, to explain why is it important. By the way, how many of you would be comfortable like coming up right now and explaining to everyone what salting is? How many of you could do that? OK, we have, we have about 10%, a bit less than 10% that could do that. So sorry to you, but for the rest of you, here's what salting is. So we have a user, and a user selects a password. Random passwords, just the first thing that comes to mind. Password one, two, three, four, five, six. And they store it in the database, registering an account. If the database is not encrypted, we're screwed. But if it uses some kind of hashing, some kind of encryption, the password is stored using a hash. Here's the presentation, representation of a shortened, I think, MD5 hash. And this is how it appears to the attacker. And it's all fine and dandy. Attacker, since hashes are irreversible, you cannot go from there to there. Attackers have to spend time and money to go through all the possible passwords that they can imagine. They will start with this one, I'm sure, and see if the hash matches. And what happens if another user comes to the same website and also registers an account? And the user is thinking, hmm, I need to select a good password. What can I remember? And the user thinks, OK, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is a good password. So they select the same password unknowingly. And the hash is also the same in the database. That means. If you have half percent of the users using the same password for, let's say, a thousand user database, instead of cracking those thousand passwords, the attacker needs to crack 900, 996 passwords because these passwords are the same for that amount of users. And if it's a million, then they need to crack, then their benefit is even better. So, Instead of doing that, which is better than not encrypting them at all, we use salting. Same users, same dumb users, same ideas, same passwords. But at the moment when they create an account, 
what your system does is it generates, let's call it a second password, randomly for each of these users. And we've audited some systems in the past, and we've seen, unfortunately, that some people implement that incorrectly. Assault, the blue one is assault, has to be unique for every user. There's not much point to just have assault for your whole system, because that means the hash is still going to be the same. It has to be unique for every user. Right? So what happens is now, before storing the hash, your system will concatenate, combine the password with the random salt, and the hashes will differ, which means, of course, you will have to store the salt, but the attacker will have to crack all the unique hashes because the attacker has no way of knowing this red part. They don't know if the password is the same or not. They have to crack each of these passwords separately. So this is the part that's being stored in the database when you use salting. Now, one, two, three, four, five, six, the most popular password. Of course, we've had 0.15% in the whole database, in all the dumps of all the passwords. But remember, at the beginning, it was promised that when you pay $45 for lifetime access, you get free weekly updates. And luckily for us in this leak, we also had free updates. I mean, we didn't have updates, but there were folders separated. This is update one, update two, update three, by weeks. So what we, were, what we were able to do, we were able to take the latest folder and look just at that. So we were able to see the latest passwords that have been added to the database. And it may be data quality. It may be that things are just getting worse. But in the latest update of all the passwords, 0.32% were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Thank you. Thank you, Kirill. Thank you, Kirill. Um, if you folks have questions, can you please come up to one of these two microphones? You can create little cues and um, yeah, ask your questions. If you're very far, I could run to you. I have a question. Um, how to uh, compose straight password? Do you have a good password? To, yeah, how to compose it? Thank you. That's, that's a good question. But my suggestion is simple. For the past 10 years, it hasn't been a problem for any system, be it online email, your computer, or your Wi-Fi, to accept passwords with spaces. And that is the easiest and most secure thing to do. Instead of a password, you use a passphrase. You use a sentence. It's easy to remember. And for a computer to crack it, it's near to impossible at the moment. So that means, first of all, they don't even know if you're one of these users that we had before that uses short password or you use a long password. They don't know that. So they can't start using a full dictionary attack on it. And even if they do, it's still, say, a password of four words is much more secure than a password of 10 symbols. And it is easy to remember. Um, I don't have the slide here. We, we, do, we do that in training. We have a sentence appearing on the slide mid-lecture when we talk about creating secure passwords. And it's a, non it's a nonsensical sentence. It has some characters. But half of the audience usually can still remember it at the end of the presentation. So just take something. Don't take anything from a book, at least not verbatim. Take a sentence and use that as your password. You, you have microphones over there. Hello. Hey, uh, I have a question about your ana per country analysis. Uh, huh. Okay, so the dot .com uh, domains, I, I'm not a technical person, but like what if the, so it, of course the gmail.com emails are the most, but then you cannot correlate it, how do you correlate it to a country? Um, so we didn't correlate that, yes. Dot .com is number one TDL that we saw in the leaks, which is understandable. Dot .com is the, one of the oldest, most popular domain TLDs that we have. And we had to make some trade-offs. We did correlation only by 
dot tld, so dot bg. If it's dot com, we didn't take a look into it deeper. We didn't try to correlate it. There are ways to do it. We can try to do it by username. Some people have a name and surname, name and surname in there. Uh, we can try to do it by IP addresses, but as I mentioned, less than 5% of the data had IP addresses associated with an account. So that's, that's a trade-off. But we still got a sample of the data population. Please. Uh, question. So uh, have you ever made a comparison between the most uh, known, well-known dictionaries like roq.txt with your password list of most used passwords? Did you have some, some such kind of analysis? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we looked at we looked at top one list of of Rocky and top one list of ours, and and it matches. It's one, two, three, four, five, six. But on a serious note, no, we we didn't actually try that because Rocky is a single leak, and it's very old leak. So yeah, that might be interesting. In in case someone invites me to to give this talk again, um, I I promise that we're gonna have a, a slide on a slide on that and how that changed. But there are two factors, so it's it will be hard to discern if the factors are because we have a single leak versus thousands of leaks or because of the time change. This is an interesting uh, question. Uh, you you talk about salting and the salting technology. Let's call it that way. Uh, does Keep us, do you know Keep us, the, the password manager? Yeah. Which is open source, obviously. Oh, obviously, but it is. And so uh, the question is if you know if Keep us uses such uh, technology or not. Okay. Um, I haven't looked into that. I would imagine that Keep us uses salting, uh, and, and, and that's, the only th that's not the only thing that a password manager, a good password manager, has to, has to use. We can take a look at how it works. I'm sure it does. I haven't looked, I just assume. But uh, what's important for password managers is actually use a very slow hashing algorithm. So that, uh, uh, sorry, a very slow encryption algorithm. It doesn't hash. Very slow Oh, there we go. Yeah, right, right. Uh, maybe it doesn't use salting. Sorry. You <laughs> uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't use hashing except for the master password because you need to be able to get the password in reverse. It's, it uses encryption. So there is no salting. In encryption in that sense, yes. But what you need to have, you have to, you, you have to use a really slow encryption and decryption algorithm um, so that the password, the master password that you use, and there, is, there are hashing algorithms involved for in the master password, that attacker cannot easily brute force it. So uh, as an example, if your database gets leaked and it's protected by a password, your password database, it's OK for you to, to wait, let's say, one, even one second after you enter the password, press Enter, it's OK for you to wait one second for the manager to say it's the right password or not. But for an attacker, if it actually takes one second of computing for each password, they're screwed. They, they will never, never crack even a nine-character random password that way. 